back in August, we had asked prayer for this trip that we were doing, a missionary trip to, to Rwanda. And um, you know, we're going to have Garrett, my son, uh, come up and give you a little rundown about where your prayers went, what your prayers did uh, in Rwanda. Garrett. All right, hello. So, my name is Garrett. Um, and as you can see, uh, Rwanda, it's a pretty small country in the, in the middle of Africa. And I don't know how many of you know, but um, about 10 years ago, there was a, a pretty big genocide going on over there. And so they're still picking themselves back up from that. And, um, and here we are. And then once upon a time, you know, a group of uh, ordinary people you know, they, they all decided, we, uh, we're going to go to Rwanda on a mission trip. And so, if, if it's a normal group of people going into a country that just came out of, from genocide, you know, that's not an everyday thing. So, it took, so for the, for the group of people from our, from our church to go to Rwanda, it took them, it, it took them a lot of faith. So, that's where your, all your prayers went to is building up the courage for all of the families that were going to that they could get to Rwanda. So that is that's um, that's my dad, Mark. And then that kid on the left, I don't know who that is, but you know, whatever. Um, that the building that you see there, that's the airport, which that's the I, that's one of the biggest airports there. And right where the sign cuts off, that's that's it. So it's a pretty small airport, but it's still big for them. So, yeah. <laughs> and that is um, that's one of the families from uh, that's the Mooch Bodies, and the, the their church, Christ Gospel Fellowship. That's the that's that was the main church that uh, we worked with. Uh, you know, they do a lot of outreaches and. Um, and that's basically what we helped them with. And then that was our mode of transportation. It's it was about a like a thirty seating bus, and that's how we got around to everywhere. And that's mostly all our team right there. And um, yeah, we took the bus everywhere. So. Um, those that you see there, those are uh, actually the houses that the people live in. So, very small. Most of the houses are one room. Uh, you'll occasionally get a house that has two rooms, but still, they, they're uh, the houses. If you can see, they're made of um, they're made of mud, and pretty. That's almost about it. Just mud, and so. Uh, that was us in Busanza. We were going door to door evangelism, and we were doing that to help get a new Christ Gospel Fellowship Church up in Busanza. So that church right now actually is already open, and we're actually praying for that that um, that church would make it off the ground and um, stay open. That is my younger brother. Um, that was when we were doing the door-to-door -door evangelism. And the kids, as you can see, they're holding his hand because um, the kid, some, most of the kids there, they had parents who died in the genocide or died of, um, of AIDS, which is a pretty big deal there. So, so some of them never really get, um, you know, they never really get loved. So they, if you would just like, when you were there, if you just hold their hand, that would make the kids so happy because they never get love like that. That was in the new Christ Gospel Fellowship Church in Busanza. And as you can see, it's really packed in there. And that church was about half the size of this uh, room. So the churches there are pretty small, and they can fit about twice as many people in that than we can. Um, that was us. Uh, we were doing like a vacation Bible school type of deal. And so that's all the kids there. And then you see my dad with the guitar. And um, those, are all the, those are all the kids who were on the trip. That's all of them lined up and we were doing a story. So that's also what we did. 
And um, that right there, that's actually, that, that's like, uh, that's the kids, that's their like toys kind of. Like they just home, they home make it just out of a stick and some string. And that's, that's all that they have. I honestly have no idea what we're doing there, but apparently I'm playing with fire and everyone else is watching me. Um, that was another day. We went to a different church uh, in Ruhaha, pretty cool name. And um, it, at that church, that, the, I think it was the crime rate in that church was much higher than anywhere else that we've been. So that was pretty exciting. That's like, that's like their version of LA. Um, that was also in the Ruhaha church. And, um, and we were doing uh, three-legged races with them. And you know they, they've never seen that kind of stuff. So it was really interesting to see them do three-legged races. Because, um, you know, like I said, they, they never do that kind of stuff because most of them don't have parents. Um, that was a church in Kabuye, uh, where uh, that building behind all those people is, that was about like a six foot by six foot room that they crammed about 200 people into. I didn't think it was physically possible. Um, and that, where, where they are, that's like the front yard basically. And that's where everyone meets every Sunday morning. And we got the opportunity to, um, to go to that church and give a little message. So that, so that church right there, it was, um, it was really neat because about 75% of it was just them singing and dancing and just praising the Lord because that, because uh, that's what they do. And um, in Rwanda, in Rwanda, the people there. They're, uh, they have so much more joy than some of the people that I see here because they have so much less and then they can give so much more. So that's, that's just really neat about the people there. Uh, this was someone we met in Rwanda. His name was uh, Aaron and he was a street evangelist. Uh, that's, my, my, that's my dad's guitar that he has. Um, but his, his other guitar, it was a... Uh, it was a homemade guitar. It was made out of just wood, glue, and some strings. And that's what he does. He goes around and uh, plays that guitar. And just, he's a street evangelist. Um, that's another church in, uh, that was another church in Kibuye. And that's us doing again. We, did, we just went around to a lot of churches, just doing vacation Bible schools. And when you do those kinds of things, the kids flock to the churches because they're not used to seeing white people. Because they, they, Rwanda, as you saw, it's a pretty small country, so they don't get a whole lot of uh, tourists there. So seeing us, they, they you know, it's kind of different because now we're the immigrant and, and, you know, we're in their turf. Uh, that's just us at the church again. And um, we're actually the bottom left picture. That was us getting ready for another um, uh, uh, vacation Bible school. And what we're in right there, that was basically our living room. And it was that small. And there was only two other rooms as bedrooms. So the spaces are pretty confined mostly. And this, uh, uh, that was in a that was in a school but was also a church and that was an English class and um, they told us we got the opportunity to teach them English so that 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 was pretty fun so we got to be teachers for a day and um, also get a little message in there as well and then as we left um, my brother he made some friends and you know and then it's always sad to get back on the plane and leave, because then you know you're going back home. You're going back home, and uh, you know, and it was such a uh, unique place that no one really wanted to go home. But you know, in the end, you always have to. Okay, so um, so in the end, it took everyone a lot of faith because it's 
because they just came back from genocide. You know, it's a pretty shaky country. But yeah, and then all these families, just from the US, ordinary people, are going to Rwanda to try to teach people about God. Now that takes an enormous amount of faith, if you ask me. So that is why your prayers and you know all the support that you gave us was so critical in order, in order for us to go to Rwanda and do what we did. And thank you. Thank you, Jared. And why don't we, um, why don't we have a couple, few more worship songs and uh, be blessed by the uh, our hula dancers and the, and the band. It's awesome that uh, Gary was able to share about his trip uh, to Rwanda and just uh, you know what a blessing that was to the people there that uh, the group that he went with that he and Mark went with were able to uh, you know share the love of Jesus with those people that were you know basically rebounding from a, a situation of the you know the terrible things that that country went through and uh, it's just awesome to see how God can work in, in uh, our lives when we make ourselves available for you know a trip like that and and uh, for anything that uh, he might be leading us to do you know for his glory uh, we're going to go ahead and continue worshiping now and uh, if you want to stand please stand this is kind of a uh, an upbeat song so uh, please join us if, uh, if you know this one
Hey, isn't it great that we can uh, praise the Lord with uh, joyful, upbeat songs like that? And uh, we get, uh, you know, the Bible in, in Psalm 150, it talks about praising God with all the different instruments and with our voices. And, uh, you know, also in the Bible, in uh, 2 Samuel uh, chapter 6 and verse uh, 14, and 2 Samuel 6 is talking about how David, King David, was bringing the Ark of the Covenant back to Israel, back to Jerusalem. And they had a big celebration going on. They would, they would take a few steps and they would sacrifice. And then David says, David, in verse 14, it says, David uh, was dancing um, with all his might before the Lord. So he was worshiping God um, in the time of celebration. They were singing and dancing to the Lord. And we're going to invite our uh, Kakohana Hobanani Hula dancers to come and join us as we continue to worship now. And uh, we're going to um, worship with our instruments, with our voices, and also with dance now with a song called Just a Closer Walk with Thee. Please join us as we worship together with Meli Ohana and uh, just praise God for our family.
You know, we are so blessed that uh, God has given us such <clears throat> beautiful songs to worship Him with, aren't we? And this song is uh, just a real blessed song that we're going to share next. Um, just talks about uh, our Savior and Messiah, Jesus Christ, and you know what He means to us.
island style <clears throat> version of how great thou art. to share with you um, and like Kevin did the last time when he uh, was filling in for um, Pastor Brad it's, it's one of those things when Pastor Brad walks up to you and he says hey can, uh, can you preach on the 30th and you know uh, and for, it, as, as I walked in my life one of the scriptures that I always kept in my heart is First uh, Peter 3.15 it says but sanctify the Lord your God in your hearts and, and be ready to give an answer so with a minute Pastor Brett asked me, I said, oh yeah, yeah, I'll do it. Then, and the last part of the verse it says um, that in meekness and fear, well, that's that's what hit me after I said yes. So, <laughs> anyways, um, so I, I, I went ahead and, and with, you know, like I said, it was, was meekness and fear, trying to think, okay, I'm going to speak, and, and oh, 
I can't. There's no way I can follow Pastor Brett the way you know he teaches. I just love the way he teaches, and um, you know that's okay. Big big step for me. So I said, okay, I'm going to pray about it and find it and come up with whatever I'm. You know, God tell me what I'm supposed to speak on. And you know, you know how many of you say, okay, I'm going to pray about it. I'm going to pray about it. You know, that's a very um, common answer we throw out there is that, oh, oh um, can you make it to the party tomorrow? Uh, let me pray about it. Or are you going to go to this, uh, this um, Bible study? Okay, let me pray about it. Well, how many of us actually really pray about it? Or is it just words that we say? So, of course, of course you know, I, I, I tell Pastor Brett, okay, let me pray about it. And, um, you know, and after coming up with several, several topics of what to speak on, you know, um, then I was seeing that God was closing the doors on all of it. I'm thinking, okay, did I really pray about it? Now, we give you an example. Okay, I was thought about praying, I mean, uh, preaching about the, the Halloween stuff. Well, of course, Pastor Brent does it the next week, and I'm just like, okay, God's closing the door. Okay, that's not what he wants me to talk about. And um, in, in uh, Brett's message, he did say, it has to be a renewing of your mind and uh, the spirit of your mind. And I found out myself I wasn't doing that. You know, I was maybe caught up in the moment being excited about doing um, a message, but I had to renew my mind and uh, listen to the Lord as what He was saying. And um, I, I get together in the morning, um, Tuesday and Wednesday mornings with a, a couple men, just to do uh, devotions. And you know, I, I'm still, I had to share with them. I said, you know, I don't know what... God wants me to talk about it because he's closed the door on everything I had thought of. So it was that morning we were studying in, uh, studying Acts and, we, and this is where Saul was was met the, met the, the Lord on the road and he was blinded and sent on to Damascus. And um, the Lord called on one of his men in Damascus. It, was, it happened to be Ananias. And in uh, Acts uh, 9.13 says, Lord, well, he, first he tells Ananias, I want you to go minister to this to Saul, you know, because um, you know I chose you. I need you to go minister to him. And then, so what does what does Ananias do? He says, "Well, Lord, I have heard um, from many about this man. That he's uh, he's done harm to to your saints." So, uh, so we're studying that verse, and one of the the men I'm with, he says, "Well, gee, he actually questioned God." And then now it's that small voice that, that the Lord uh, says to you. He says, um, the Lord says, this is what I want you to talk about. Okay? We're questioning, questioning the Lord. Because um, I thought, okay, is that, is that saying that I shouldn't be questioning the Lord? Or, you know, how am I going to follow, follow the Lord? And, um, you know, the, the last couple of Sundays, Pastor Brett was talking about your faith and, and growing in your faith. So... I'm sitting there, okay. Uh, he closed the doors on these. He, now he, he throws this verse out there and someone says, oh, you know, we're going to question the Lord. And I started thinking about those characters in the Bible of, you know, what did they do? Well, it, you know, we have characters like Noah. You know, Noah, he's, uh, you know, in Genesis 6, uh, you know, verses 13 to 22, God gives him, tells him he's going to destroy the earth and tells him to make yourself uh, an ark of gopher wood, make rooms in the ark, and cover it inside and outside with, with pitch. And, you know, it's at that time of the, uh, um, of the world when it never really rained, it never even flooded, and nobody really needed a boat. So here, God's telling him to make this thing, and what does Noah do? He just does it. He, he doesn't ask any questions. Um, then we have an example with uh, Abraham. He, he told... You know, arise and um, God says, "I'm going to give you all this land. Arise and walk, walk through its length and its width, because He's going to give it to you." So, what does Abraham do? He does it. He doesn't ask any questions. Um, and then Sarah, well, there's a um, Sarah was uh, God told her, "You're going to um, have a child at 90 years old," and um, you know she laughed, but you know she didn't really question it. Um, and then we have the uh, faith of Gideon, um, where where he he was supposed to, God told him tear down the altar of Baal that his uh, that his father had. So what does Gideon do? He tears it down. He didn't he didn't ask any questions. Um, so I said, well, what about the people who 
actually um, question God. And so I was thinking about that. Um, I said, so there's got to be people who ask questions because we all ask questions about what God's asking us to do. So uh, I sat, sat there and was going through looking for verses. And, you know, in Genesis 17, 17, when I mentioned about Sarah, um, they asked the question, well, shall a child be born to a man who's 100 years old and, and Sarah who's 90? So, she, so they did ask a question. God answered it, but uh, you know, they were able to answer the question. Even Mary asked, in, uh, she asked me about, well, how can she have a child without knowing a man? So she asked questions. Now, the, the person who asked the most questions is Moses. And, uh, and um, in, in Exodus, uh, God had chosen him to, to free his people in, in Egypt. And um, so what is, you know, God has given them some instructions. So what's the first thing Moses does is, who am I that I should go to, go to Pharaoh and that he should you know, free his children from Egypt? So, you know, God... Yeah, you know, answers this question. Now, it, it, this, is what, this is what it reminds me of as parents. You know, your kids keep asking all these little questions all the time. Well, this is, here's Moses. He's asked that first question. Then that next question, he says, well, what if the people ask, what is his name? What shall I say? Then he says, then he follows that up with, well, but suppose they don't believe me. You know, they, and, you know, they don't believe me and, and they don't listen, listen to my voice. And suppose they say, the Lord has not appeared to you. So here, so it doesn't stop there. So Moses keeps asking questions. Oh my Lord, you know I'm not eloquent in speech. So, so he 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 throws that question out, and then finally he says, Oh Lord, send somebody else. And what happens? Well, that's five questions. And by this time in Exodus 4:14, it says the anger of the Lord is kindled against Moses. So, you know, uh, just just so so you all know. When you question the Lord, don't ask five questions. So, <laughs> so but in, in this case, you know, the Lord got, did get upset with Moses. But why did he get upset? Well, in the end, that last, the very last question uh, that, that Moses asks is he says, he says, send some, he really wants someone else, God to send somebody else. So he actually didn't want to go. So he actually, God's, God got a little bit upset with him. I mean, just like when you tell your kids to clean the room, you know, or how about brush your teeth? Oh, that, that's another one. Um, we get a little upset when you just have to keep repeating it or you can keep telling them. Um, <clears throat> so, well, I don't want to end with that, but uh, Gideon asked the question uh, early on when God chose him. He said, oh, oh, my Lord, how can I save Israel? You know, indeed, my clan is the weakest in Manasseh. And... He's the, he's the least in his father's house. So these are people that were able to ask God questions. So naturally, I said, okay, God, you know, what am I talking about on Sunday? So, and um, the, the, those are the words that he gave me. But um, the question actually came to, um, to me talking about uh, how, what, what message am I going to preach, but also... Uh, the, the question that I said earlier was, "There's no way I can follow what Brett was teaching." But God, you know, <laughs> never, never say never because God's going to show you, the, uh, show you the way. Um, but the, the next, the, as the weeks passed, more and more, God was just pouring out to me, saying, "Well, how do we build our faith?" Okay, since Pastor Brett was talking about it, so I thought I'd talk a little bit about that. And uh, <clears throat> of course, we go back to the Bible and look at how did, how did the Lord built faith in people. Well, with Abraham, he uh, the, Abraham actually uh, early on in, in when uh, it was Abram and Sarai, when the Egyptians came, he pretended that Sarai was his sister, and then she had to go off with the Egyptians. And now he's how was he going to get him get her back? Well, the Lord's plagued the Pharaoh in his house with great plagues. That's when you know when he was able to get uh, Sarai back. So that was one thing. Then the child at, at, a, at a great old age, fine old age, and then uh, God, God delivers Isaac uh, with, the lamb, with the sacrificial lamb. So God actually does things in his life to, to show him, you know, you can, you can trust me. Same with Gideon. When Gideon uh, was uh, chosen to, uh, to uh, rid his land of the Midianites, what did the Lord do? Well, 
Well, Gideon asked, well, I want a sign. So he builds an altar to the Lord, and the Lord consumes the meat and the unleavened bread uh, by fire. And then, so, okay, he's, he's built Gideon's faith a little step at a time. He destroys the altar of Baal, and he doesn't get into trouble. And then he ends up going on cutting his army down to size and then defeats the Midianites. So he's doing stepwise um, development of, what, of Gideon's faith. Um, in Peter, well, you know, a lot of people are familiar with Peter, um, but Peter's mom was dying. And in, in um, Matthew 8, 14, uh, Jesus had come to Peter's house and he saw that um, Peter's uh, mother-in-law was sick, was laying sick with fever. So Jesus actually touches her and heals her. So, wow, if he's going to heal my mother-in-law, gosh, God can do just about anything. So, um, so that again, that's another step that he does with Peter. And then um, Jesus actually has Peter, Peter step out of the boat and walk on the water. So it, it's, it's a progressive thing where God sits there, will, will slowly do things in your life to build, um, to build you up and to build your faith. Um, now, you know, how does, he, how does he do it? Well, he does it differently in different people. I mean, um, my experience is going to be different from yours. But you, you have to be open to, you know, what he, how God works in your life. Um, in Luke 8, uh, Luke 8, verses uh, 42, 42 to 48, um, here's, here, this is a verse um, where it says Jesus was on his way, he's, he's walking through the crowds, and the, um, there's a woman who had been subject to bleeding for a long, long, long time, and she touched, touched the edge of his cloak, and immediately the bleeding stopped. So it was with, um, and Jesus right away says, well, who touched me? And, and, um, and when everybody denied, it was like the, the woman couldn't, couldn't escape. She had to tell him it was me. So, uh, but in, in the end, he says, daughter, you know, you, your faith has healed you. Go in peace. Well, I, I just thought as I was studying this, it, 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 was, it touched me where the woman touched the edge of uh, Jesus' cloak. And... Uh, it kind of in your life when Christ or when God is developing your faith, He actually takes you to the edge of something that you're going on that goes is going on in your life. You know, whatever it is, it could be um, could be a marriage, it could be uh, something about your child, it could be um, something about your job. But God usually takes you to the edge and to see what you know. Uh, actually has to take you to the edge so he can minister to you. <clears throat> so where is, where is your edge or where is my edge? Well, um, I have to talk about um, back when I was a younger Christian, but still I was probably considered a, one of those corporate academic type Christians. Yes, I'm a Christian and you know, you study the Bible, you do all the, you speak the Christianese and all that kind of stuff. And you know, your life kind of goes on and it, it, there's no real challenges in your life. Well, uh, one of the first challenges we had that in my life was uh, when my wife Lori was pregnant with my daughter Janelle. And um, this is a, you know, it was our first child, and she was actually born at 36 weeks. She was in, uh, premature, she was in, in the neonatal intensive care. And that was a, that was a very a tough time in, in our life to, to know that, you know, she was born, but her room was all set up, but there was no child in the room. And it was quite, it, it was, it was quite, uh, I, at that time, taking us to our edge. You know, it, it was um, going, going, thinking about what faith means is, is um, the substance, substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen, uh, for by it the elders, elders obtain good testimony. Well, we didn't know the outcome. We, we just had to have, it was that step, God taking us to the edge and us depending on Him. Because there was not nothing else, there's not really nothing you do other than listening to what the doctors are going to say. But uh, down inside, it, it was, was the... You're the next uh, step in faith that uh, 
that took us through. And here it says, by good testimony, um, whatever whatever um, event that you've struggled through, it is going to be a good testimony for somebody. So uh, just keep that in mind. Um, but one of the verses that, that I continue to run through my mind was in Proverbs 3, 5. It says, trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not unto your own understanding. Well, I was in the medical field. I knew a lot of stuff. And I, you can't... You can't you can't lean on your own understanding because it's, it's quite stressful if you do that. Um, so you had to lean on the Lord. Um, and so we got through that. We, um, the Lord, you know, Janelle grew up fine. And she's, uh, she grew up and is now 17 years old. Really exciting. She's getting ready for college. And like Pastor Brett had shared about Cody, it's, it's, uh, it's another step. But, um, so uh, that was one step of, of our, our, our journey in growing our faith. So God wasn't done though. I think he knew, okay, that was too easy for you. We're going to give you something else. Um, well, so uh, we, we are now expecting a second child. Okay, and Lori is, is, was considered a high-risk pregnancy. So now she's pregnant with another uh, another child. And in this case, um, she, we had to go to perinatology and they do the ultrasounds and everything else. Well, at 18 weeks, they found that um, Garrett, <laughs> Garrett had a, a heart that was displaced to the side. To, to off, um, it wasn't in the right place. And um, they came up with these terms, co coarctation of the aorta and torturous aorta and that type of stuff. And they said, no, they really have to watch this. Um, well, as, as the, the pregnancy proceeded, week 22, the thing was, you know, was still there. And they were talking about planning uh, what we're going to have to look forward to, the possibilities. And back in 1994, they didn't have a lot of the, the, the things they have now. Well, one of the things they did say was, uh, one of the first things they offered was abortion. And, you know, I thought I was a strong Christian, and I thought God had equipped me, but it was a, was a surprise to me. I couldn't answer the question. I was in shock. I didn't know. I, I, I knew I didn't want it, but, but it was my wife who came up, no, right away, she, you know, she says no. And I, I couldn't believe how... My, how my tongue was so tied that I couldn't say no. And uh, I think I was in shock that that was even offered. But um, anyways, thank God for, for Lori. She, she was just right on the ball. She said no. And we continued to, uh, and because we made that decision, they started to lay out the whole process about what could happen. And um, we had to meet with, or we had to get cardiac surgeons and, Cardiologists and everybody else on in a, in a meeting talking about okay when when uh, when the baby reaches term is delivered they're going to have to go in and do these corrections and um, they, they did share with us that the survival rate was very low and um, and one of the things that um, was going through my mind well you know um, Lori had shared with me about somebody had said what well, if God meant for us to have that child for that short of you know hours, minutes, hours. Well, then that, that's the way it's going to be. So it was a, a another trial for, of faith to put faith in in the Lord and not necessarily um, you know the doctors. We went through with the procedure you know week 28, 34, and they they could still see it and um, the part that just is, is still um, still touches me is. Uh, when he was born, um, I went with one of the nurses. After he was born, they put him into incubator and wheeled him off into the neonatal intensive care. And the nurse happened to, who I was, uh, actually she goes to St. Church, um, we know, and she said, I can't believe they offered abortion for this. And anyways, as we rolled him into the neonatal intensive care, they put him, they did the x-rays and ultrasound and, and the neonatal intensive care person was there, the x-ray, the, the radiologist, and they put the x-rays up and they, they turned him and they said, there's nothing there. And it was, 
it's it was one of those things that just shaped you, um, you know, to the foundation. And for me, it was that ne next step in uh, the growth of uh, faith that, uh, in the Lord. And they actually, the, the two physicians actually said, actually said, you know, it wasn't them, you know. It, they said that, you know, if they, of course, they couldn't use the word, but they just said, you know, it's it was it was another power other than us. So it was the guy upstairs. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it was the guy upstairs. The guy upstairs. Yeah, they, <laughs> my wife Lori over here. <laughs> um, so, but part, you know, it was it was one of those times when you felt alone. I I, I looked at these. Uh, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. And Romans eight twenty eight says, and we all know that all things work together for the good for those who love God and for those who called according to his purpose. And, you know, I ran through those verses in my mind, but I said, how does it apply to me here? It was, it was, it was rough, you know, to find, to find the verse, comforting verse during that time. But um, God still brought us through. Um, and uh, as, I, as I talk about this, it was the, one of those things that when God speaks, he speaks, he's, speaks in a still small voice. It says in Kings 19.12, it's 1 Kings, it says, Behold, the Lord passed by, and there was a great strong wind, and he tore, the, the, tore into the mountain and broke the rocks into pieces uh, before the Lord. And, but the Lord wasn't in the wind, um, and after the wind was an earthquake, but the Lord wasn't in the earthquake, and after that a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. But then after, there was that still small voice. Well, um, I the... With a hustle and bustle in our day, we have to sit and and, um, and listen for that still small voice. And when it came time, you know, as um, the still small voice came up, it says, "What are what are you doing here, Elijah?" Well, that same voice comes up and says, "What are you doing here? What are we doing?" And um, as as being a father, a parent, raising the kids. Um, that that small voice continued to to whisper in in your ear, uh, raising these raising the children up, but um, and raising them up in the uh, in the um, as godly children. And when it came time for missions trips, uh, this is where we're going with this. Since Garrett spoke about the missions trips, um, that was another step of faith. It's like, okay, well, God, you you brought the kids here. You you brought um, Janelle through her her pre uh, being a preemie and then she and now bringing Garrett through that storm and uh, bringing us all the way to the point where how can we not say you know when the God when God asks us to go how can we not say we can't go so um, it had been a, a a process of building faith in the Lord and um, and putting it into action taking that step and going on, on into the mission field. Um, it, that, that picture there is uh, the Rwanda trip from 2008. Garrett was preaching a, a message in, in Rwanda, and um, it, was, it was quite a touching for me to know that we, we went what we went through to get him to that state, stage on a mission, in the mission field to, to preach that message uh, to the kids. And, you know, that's Garrett down here in the, and again, in 2011, he's wearing the same shirt, so we're being good stewards. <laughs> uh, anyways, uh, so I just wanted to close that you, uh, our, our steps in faith are little, some are, are quite large, um, but we want, we just, we want to make, keep those ears open and listening to what the Lord has to say to you. And, um, and each, each step prepares you f for for his plan for your life. So, um, anyway, so worship team, if you want to come up.